Hi guys, Nada here, and today AMD is launching their brand new RDNA 2 graphics card that is supposed to be both affordable and available, uh, the Radeon RX 6500 XD. It is a low-end card with only 4 gigabytes of VRAM and an MSRP of $200, and because of its low spec, this card should not be as interesting to miners as the other cards that came out recently and hopefully there will be enough to keep it on the shelves and away from scalpers or at least that is what AMD is counting on and what we will find out very soon. Now I tested both the ASUS Tough Gaming OC as well as the Gigabyte Gaming OC that I have right here so let's see how these cards perform and if they are worth buying at all. Let's go! This video is brought to you by Seasonic and their Prime Series power supplies. These top quality power supplies are very efficient, they're whisper quiet, extremely reliable and my go-to choice for most of my test rigs and builds around here. And to make the deal even sweeter, Seasonic wraps it all up in a cozy 12 year long warranty. Check them out using the links in the description below. So while the name 6500 XT suggests that it is only one step below the RX 6600, uh, if we look at the specs we can see that there is a much bigger gap actually between the two. The RX 6600 features 28 compute units and 1792 stream processors, while the RX 6500 is down to 16 compute units and 1024 stream processors. It also features half the memory, half the memory bus and half the total transistors, but it does have higher boost clocks. So while most of the core features are the same, AMD removed some features that uh, we have come to expect from these RDNA cards. So there is no hardware encoding and no AV1 decoding, for example. Now this doesn't really affect gaming, uh, but it does mean that using this GPU for streaming or for video editing is going to be a problem. And the lack of AV1 support is probably a bit harder to judge right now, but it can affect video playback of certain files. So Netflix uh, has already started rolling out AV1 streams and while it's completely optional now, it is possible that at some point in the future you may actually require AV1 decoding for higher quality video streams, so keep all this in mind. But let's see how it holds up in a couple of games. I am going to put all the details of my test system in the description down below, so if you're interested you can check that out. Now normally I would compare GPUs in a variety of games in ultra and high settings, but 4GB uh, of VRAM on these cards is just not enough to run most modern AAA titles on ultra or high settings, even on a 1080p resolution. Now VRAM is usually pretty simple and you basically just need to have enough of it uh, to run a certain quality setting and if you don't, the performance will be strongly affected. So if you're looking for a new GPU to run games at their highest quality settings, you should look for a card that has at least 6 gigabytes or ideally 8 gigabytes of VRAM. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the RTX 2060 Super and the RX 6600 uh, will give you about 120 FPS or more, while this card comes in at 77 FPS. Now 77 is still nicely playable, uh, while the 1650 for example is struggling with an average FPS of 57. Troy Total War on high settings shows a very similar picture. Uh, this card is nowhere near the 6600 and the RTX 2060 Super, but it is still ahead of the 1650. So it is just clear that this new card doesn't come close to uh, modern mid-range cards and any sort of comparison between them just looks very sad for this 6500. So uh, to make a bit more sense of all of this, I actually adjusted the settings per game to account for the 4 gigabytes of VRAM and to see if I can at least get this card to play most games comfortably. Uh, I didn't have other 4 gigabyte cards laying around because I didn't really expect that I would be retesting those in 2022, but ASUS was kind enough to lend me a 1650 to have at least something to compare this card to. In Far Cry 6, using medium settings, uh, we get a little bit over 80 FPS, which is uh, perfectly playable. In Outriders, the gap with the 1650 is a bit bigger, with the 6500 XT getting a comfortable 87 FPS on medium settings. 
Assassin's Creed Odyssey also ran well on medium settings with an average of 99 FPS. And in the latest Assassin's Creed Valhalla, it had a bit of a harder time with an average of 66 FPS. Uh, but even with occasional dips below 60, I would say it offered a relatively smooth experience, while the 1650 struggled even on medium settings. In Watch Dogs Legion on medium settings, the 6500 XT scored a nice 76 FPS average. Metro Exodus is a notoriously heavy game to run, but on medium settings again, uh, you get a reasonable 70 FPS, which makes the game perfectly playable. In Borderlands 3, where 1650 does pretty well actually, the new Radeon card still comes out stronger. Now, World War Z is an AMD title, so as expected, this card comes out pretty strong here as well. And in Wolfenstein Youngblood, the 6500 XT gets a nice 134 FPS average, which puts it about 30% ahead of the 1650 once again. The latest Call of Duty Vanguard runs really well on medium settings with a result of 92 FPS. And in CSGO, the average FPS looks great at around 350. However, in competitive games, 1% lows are crucial and these drop to around 70 with this card. It is still better than the 1650, but if you play this game competitively, you should consider buying a stronger card. Apex Legends looks a bit better in that regard, with its 1% lows closer to the average and a respectable 100 FPS average on 1080p high settings. Control is a bit of a different story, and here we can actually see the 6500 XT struggling to hit 60 FPS, even on a medium setting. Now, it's not a super high-paced game, so this should be good enough for most casual gamers, but I would still recommend dropping a few settings down to low to maintain a consistent 60 FPS average. But there will always be games that are so heavy or so unoptimized that won't be able to run on low-end hardware at all, uh, like Cyberpunk 2077, uh, where even if you drop everything to low, you end up with a 53 FPS average. Now, my test run is actually very heavy on the GPU, with most areas of the game running a bit better, so you can play it, but it will be quite rough. Uh, but surprisingly enough, God of War actually runs completely fine on this card, either at the original setting with an average of 76 FPS or at low settings with an 85 FPS average, and that is measured in combat where your frame rates matter the most. I only tested the 1650 on low settings uh, because even then it struggled to hit 60 FPS. So while it looks good against the three-year-old 1650, uh, you still really have to manage your expectations a lot. Uh, even though most games will run completely fine at 1080p medium, uh, the reality is that with every new game that comes out, you will have to spend some time uh, playing with the settings to you know, make it run smoothly. Now, it is obvious that this card is a 1080p card at best, but I do want to share a couple of Quad HD results, you know, just for reference. Uh, now that upscaling is a thing, uh, 1440p gaming on low-end GPUs is becoming more and more viable, so games that do support AMD's FSR in particular do well with this card. Uh, Far Cry 6 and God of War are great examples of games that showed pretty decent frame rates actually, but without upscaling, games do not run well on this resolution. So I would not recommend this card if you do plan on gaming on high resolutions at some point. But there is a big issue with this card that you should definitely know about. So this is a PCI Express 4 card using four lanes, uh, while other GPUs typically use 16, and that limits the amount of data that can be transferred between your GPU and your CPU. And as long as you have a PCIe 4 system, this doesn't matter at all. So if you use an 11th or 12th gen Intel system with a 500 series motherboard or newer, or if you have an 5000 series Ryzen CPU and an AMD 500 series motherboard, you're gonna be good. But if you want to buy this card for an older system that only has PCIe Gen 3 lanes, you will be limiting the bandwidth between your GPU and the rest of your system, and that might strongly affect the performance. And as far as I understood from Twitter, uh, Hardware Unboxed is looking into this issue specifically, so make sure you also watch their video if you're thinking of buying this card for an older system. 
uh, but let's check out the two cards that I have right here. So the Asus Tough is a surprisingly well-built card with a pretty extensive feature set. It has a proper metal backplate, a surprisingly thick and heavy heatsink, uh, two large fans with a fan stop mode, and there is even a dual BIOS mode with a physical switch. Now, Gigabyte Gaming OC has a bit of a slimmer design, but it still looks like a proper gaming GPU with its three fans. It clearly has a bit of a cheaper design. Uh, it is lighter, the backplate is plastic, and it doesn't support dual BIOS. Uh, but the fans do stop in idle, which is probably the only feature that you should really want on a budget card. Now, both of these cards only include one display port and one HDMI 2.1 connection, which I assume is a limitation from the chip itself. And in terms of gaming performance, uh, the Asus Tough Gaming card has slightly higher clock speeds out of the box, with both cards showing the same memory speeds. Now, the boost speed difference is very small, and it will result in only about a 2% performance difference on average. And with a chip like this one, you're usually talking about a one to two frames of a difference between these two, which is not something that you will ever really notice. Now the thicker heatsink pays off when looking at thermal and noise performance as well. So the Asus Tough Gaming Card runs a few degrees cooler and it is almost completely inaudible thanks to a lower fan RPM. But the Gigabyte Card isn't loud either and while a bit warmer than the Asus Card, its 50 degree core temperature is still extremely low. So I would say uh, both coolers are basically an overkill with one of them being a bit more overkill than the other. Now, power consumption is completely the same, uh, with both of these cards using about 12 watts more than the ROG version of the GTX 1650, and considering the better overall performance, those 12 watts extra are very much so worth it. That also means that you don't really need a high-end power supply for any of these two cards, so most a brand 300 to 400 watt power supplies that have the required six pin power connector uh, should be completely fine if you combine these cards with a similar budget processors. So between the two, uh, the Asus Tough Gaming feels like a nicer option, but this is usually what Asus does in the budget segment. So they focus completely on making the bestest product and just lose sight of what these cards are meant to be, which is cheap. So when you're shopping for a budget card, you don't really need to pay extra for these extra features or the overkill performance, and you are way better off with a slightly less fancy, but still a decent card. Now, considering this is a very budget segment, even this gigabyte, mind you, uh, might end up being an overkill compared to some even cheaper alternatives. So basically, this means that you should keep an eye on the prices. I assume that the Gigabyte is going to be cheaper and will make more sense for anyone that is on a budget, but if the prices end up being the same, or at least very similar, the Tough Gaming is better. But should you buy this card at all? So the 6500 XT is extremely cut down from the RX 6600 and its performance is nowhere near the mid-range cards like the RTX 2060. The four gigabytes of VRAM prevents you from running most games on high settings. Uh, they cut out a lot of encoding and decoding support and there is a serious concern for anyone uh, who would be buying this card for an older system. So there is a lot of things to consider before buying this card at all. Now the MSRP is $200, but I heard that these third-party cards will be around 300 to 350 euros here in the Netherlands. Uh, I'm not sure about the US, but I suppose it will be the same. And even if that ends up being correct, it is still not a bad deal. Uh, for those 350 euros, you can just about get a GTX 1650 right now, and the 6500 XT does perform better. Now, beating an almost three-year-old card is a really sad compliment, in my opinion, but it will at least be an improvement for anyone on a really tight budget, because if you look at the next real step, it will be the 6600 and up, and that will cost you 550 euros and up, which is a big 
difference. So I would say it is just a really bad time to buy a GPU right now. And if you can hold out a little bit longer, I would really recommend you do so. Or at least wait for the NVIDIA RTX 3050 to come out, which is rumored to be somewhere next week. Uh, its MSRP is $250. Uh, it should be a direct competitor and it will be worth waiting a couple of days more to see how it compares to this one. Uh, till then, that is all I have to say about this card. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a like and don't forget to subscribe to never miss an upload. Bye guys and see you in the next one.